Great. Well, welcome everyone to the next installment of our Global Mass Stories Conference. We're so happy to have you all here with us um, this afternoon. Uh, this presentation is Finland Reindeer Racing, and we are really excited to have Dr. Chad McGlone with us as our presenter this afternoon. Um, Dr. McGlone is the co-founder and former executive director of MathKind. He is also the actual creator of the original idea of the Global Math Stories resource that we use here at MathKind. Um, Chad has a PhD in mathematics and statistics education. And before MathKind's creation in 2014, he spent 15 years working in classrooms, teaching math and science to college students. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Chad McGlone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad that we're doing this. Um, I love seeing <clears throat> that math kind is using global math stories in this way, and I'm excited for the direction we're headed with them. Um, I'm sure you've seen this slide a few times already this week, but remember just to be a curious thinker when you're working with me um, and in this session to particularly think about, and I'm saying this for myself, uh, the, the the translation and the multi-language because speaking too quickly might be uh, hard to keep up with. Uh, be respectful. You know, with me, I do, a, it's it's perfectly fine, especially in a group this size, to just ask a question. So it's fine to, for me to, if you just say, hold on a second, I have a question. Uh, in fact, I want you to participate quite a, a lot. We're not going to necessarily break into groups to do a mathematical task, especially given the size. Uh, we can work on it sort of together, but most importantly, throughout the session, I want you all to ask the questions that you see, the math questions you, you see, and your, to communicate your thinking to us. So let me get the right button here. There we go. So we're doing reindeer racing, and reindeer racing is something that people do in, in Finland. What I love about the work that we have that we're doing with these presentations is it allows me, the teacher, to share other components than the objective I'm teaching. So my students come to the classroom and think, I'm going to do math today. And while I'm here, I'm going to learn an objective. And that's a different kind of thinking. Often we say, today, your objective is such and such. We sometimes write it on the board. And everything we do is supposed to be toward that objective. I think maybe we do it a little differently. I think we teach math and that objective is sometimes part of it. It was always part of it in some way. So today, our objective will be to do some multiplication tasks in a real world setting. I want you to be mathematicians all along. I'm going to expand the part I would typically do with my students so that we have time to really dig into that sort of extra area of the lesson. So this first lesson is about reindeer racing in Finland. And you see Finland's on this map here. It's the country in red in Northern Europe. So what do you all think about Finland? What kinds of things do you notice about it that you wanna sort of make predictions about? Weather, population, things like that. So you all can come off mute now. And, and I am a teacher, so I'll sit here and stare at you until someone talks. I think it's a small place with a small population. Okay, small place with a small population. Yeah, how does it compare to Ecuador in size? What do you all think? You put it. Al parecer, Finlandia es un poco más grande. And Finland seems to be a little bit larger. At least somebody can tell in the map. Yeah, a little bit. It's hard to say exactly how much, and you have to estimate. But would you say it's safe to say it's larger? Pretty much agree. Would you all put thumbs up if you agree that it's it's larger than Ecuador? Certainly larger than Guatemala. Uh huh. Yeah. 
And so also cold, do you think it's cold in Finland? Do you think it's warm? Do you think it's both? What do you think? Yes, Patricia, yes. Do you have a question or a comment? Are you, you put your hand up to say you agree. Put your thumbs up, I'm sorry. Oh, Megla was uh, saying that we should raise our hand or some stuff yes. to indicate whether it was larger than Ecuador. That's why I was raising my hand. But yes. I think based on the location, I think it's cold. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very cold. Yep, I agree. In the winter time, yeah. Um, and so I have a couple of maps of Ecuador. You know, I mean, not Ecuador, Finland. So here's the shape of Finland. And, and what I'm curious to know is what kinds of things can you, you interpret from this map? Can you tell me, can you tell me what the population density is from it? What can you interpret from it? What do you think? What do you think this map over here on the left is? What does it tell you? <clears throat> so, you know, especially you guys. Okay, so, yep. So can you unmute and let us know that, Jorge? Because there are so few people here and I am doing okay with some of my Duolingo, but I'm not. Um, to the high enough level to read it all. So if you tell us, then um, I could also respond. Go ahead, go ahead, Jorge. Que a simple vista, la parte superior se ve que está... It looks like the part in the north, it looks like there's a larger city in comparison to the other cities. The other ones mm -hmm. look smaller, but it looks like the city in the top is like a third of the whole country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lapland, I think fact, it's called. Yep, Lapland, yes. In fact, that's not a city, but in, it's a state. It's one of the it's states. Of Ecuador. Ecuador. Yes. Yeah, the agua, I mean. It's also surrounded fully by water. So It is surrounded by water. Island, I guess it's fully surrounded by water. It's, yeah, it's not it's totally an island. You see, it's part of, of the mainland here, but it's on this little peninsula. So, you're, but, but also, do you notice all the water down here? All these lakes? Algo similar a las Islas Galápagos acá en Ecuador. Maybe like the Galápagos Island in Ecuador. A little it's bit. Surrounded by water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what this looks like for sure. There are islands here, lots and lots of islands on this place, but there are lots of lakes as well. We'll see that in a second. So if I ask the question, where are the most of the people live here in, in Finland? You really can't answer with this information, but you can with this map. Where do most of the people live in Ecuador based on these maps? And what, why do you think that's the case? Do you think they live up north in Lapland? Do you think in the Finland? south? Yeah, in Finland. Sorry. Thank you. You yes. said Ecuador, but I think you I did. I did. Finland, I right? know. Yes. I know. I I started talking about Ecuador with you, pal, earlier today. And Al sur, now it's stuck in the brain. Al sur, porque Towards the south, because mm -hmm. it's colder at the north. And yeah. there aren't many people living there, but the south and lower part. Um, mm -hmm. at the beaches here close to the oceans, I imagine it's warmer, but perhaps because of where it's located in the map, it perhaps tends to be maybe like a tropical weather, like we would say here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I like what you're saying. You're using what you're using the information that you're gathering to make inferences. And, and honestly, that's what we want our students to do at all times. 
Yes, when I'm teaching a subject, an object, a, a class, a subject, but also throughout, and and to ask questions and to challenge each other as well. So what I would say is it's pretty far north, and so maybe it's not tropical, but in fact, most people do live in the south. And you can actually look at some information here that tells you what what about the south says there are more people living in this area than up here. What 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 data? What information can you see there that makes, gives you that impression? But you see, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on because, but there are a lot of roads down here. So literally, the person who's writing the map can send the message, can tell the story, based on the information they provide. I can't provide what the hills are like or where forests are in this map because I'm focusing on cities and streets and roads. This is purely population density. So whatever map you see tells you what you're looking at. <clears throat> so Finland is a place that's known as the sauna capital of the world. Do you guys know what a sauna is? is anyone, I know, Kim, you've probably been in a sauna. We love saunas. They're like these steam rooms, um, but we don't love them as much as they do in Finland because in Finland, there's one sauna for every two people. So imagine that a family of four might have two saunas um, in Finland. So if there are 3 million saunas in Finland, about how many people live there in Finland? You know, that's sort of an easy math problem, but this is the kind of stuff I want my students to be thinking. This is what I want everyone to think. You know, when people say I'm not a mathematician, that's not true because probably most of you were thinking, oh, there may be about 6 million people in, in Finland. How's that compared to the Ecuador population? How many people are in Ecuador? Does anyone know? What's the population of Ecuador? No one knows. So what should check on the internet and find out? I, I just looked it up. Approximately Approximately 16 million. Yeah, 16 yeah. million. So so do you think there's and less? So, go ahead. Yeah. So I would I would say the thing I'm thinking about is how does that population density compare to here? Would I be feeling more crowded in Ecuador or more crowded in Finland? You don't have to answer that. These are the things that global math stories allow teachers to do. They get to ask those questions. Finland is has a lot of wildlife and a lot of nature, and it's very valued. In fact, 70% of Finland is covered by forest. And this is the thing I think is surprising to me. There are over 187,000 lakes in Finland. Is that surprising? What do you guys think when you hear that? Uh -huh. 187,000 lakes. What does that mean even? So someone come off mute, talk please. Muchos de agua. Yeah, Mucha's agua, yeah. I think it's much, much more than what we have in, in Ecuador, for example, where I live. Yeah. Yeah, right. A hundred and seven, like, it seems like almost every house could see a lake, maybe. I would almost not believe that fact. In fact, if my teacher said it, I'd probably say, seriously, I need to check that myself. And, and that's the kind of thinking we want our students to do. And when they do global math stories, of course, I wouldn't spend 15 minutes talking about this. It'd be five or two. But still, we want we want kids to be thinking about this. The other thing is, how much of the of Finland do you think is covered by lakes? If there are 887,000. What percentage of Finland do you predict is covered by lakes? Mm -hmm. Any idea? You should have an idea. You certainly could put a range on it. Do you think half of Finland's covered by lakes? Think 50% of Finland's covered by lakes? 
Más porque habla del 70%. More. I think somewhere said 70%. 70% is covered by forest. So that means... Entonces el 30% de los, de los lagos. So maybe 30%? Right. Maybe 30 or less, right? Because people yeah. live there too. Mm -hmm. 8 million people. No, 6 million mm -hmm. people. Para ser exacto, sería... Sería aproximadamente el 30%, porque ahí llegamos. So approximately 30%, because we have 70% of uh, forest and 30% of water. And then you would come to 100% of the population. Or the places yes. that are not lakes and forest. Right. So, Jorge, what are you going to say? Uh, the saying, uh, I was thinking about. Eh, I was thinking where then people will live. Right. So if in this 70% of uh, forests, are homes also included? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Right. So we want to change that a little bit. Now, again, this is not the topic I'm teaching, but what's what I love about Global Math Stories is that allows this conversation to happen or for you to just think it. Because... That's what mathematicians are doing all the time. They're thinking, why is that the case? Is that really the case? What's the alternative? Do you know Finland's pretty far north? In fact, in the summertime, in some places in Finland, the sun doesn't set. In fact, this is midnight here in northern Finland. This is even after midnight, about 2 or 3 a.m., isn't that pretty amazing? <clears throat> so also in Finland, they have, they very, really value their vacations and people vacation in the summertime. In fact, every person in Finland is guaranteed a one month vacation each year. It's required by law. In addition to that, they're not allowed to work more than 40 hours a week unless they have a special permit. So it's a space that values wildlife, values nature, and also values the time to relax. So this is what summer's like. What do you suppose winter is like? How much, how much darkness do you suppose there is? So Finland's very cold in the wintertime. Um, some places the sun doesn't rise in the winter. If it doesn't set in the summer, doesn't it make sense that it doesn't rise in the winter? Um, if you are a person interested in seeing the aurora borealis, as my wife is, um, then Finland might be a good place to go because it, you can see that you're more likely to see the aurora borealis, not because they're more prevalent there necessarily, but because in the wintertime, it's darker longer. So the odds of seeing this phenomenon increase, right? You probably wouldn't see it in the summertime because it doesn't, the sun doesn't really set. All right, so that's Finland. Let's get into reindeer racing. Reindeer racing is a popular sport in the wintertime in Finland. One, because it's cold, and um, it's just an, an activity that people can do and enjoy together. So here are a couple of pictures of reindeer racing or reindeer racing events. I'm going to show you a couple more. Now, I need you all to respond to some things here. So tell me what kinds of things are you seeing in these events? What, what kinds of things are you noticing? This is, it doesn't have to be math things, just what do you notice? Is it something that's very well organized? Do you think a lot of people do it? Do they have the same kind of track everywhere they go? What kinds of things do you notice? I see, like we would say here in Ecuador, there's like a, like a celebration, it looks like that they celebrate that. And some of the things is the rein, 
reindeer racing. It seems like children, grown-ups participate. And uh, our reindeers almost seem like they're pets. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like they're sliding in the ice mm -hmm. because of the snow uh, that probably falls a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. And and the reindeer look like they're enjoying themselves. Don't they look like they're smiling? And here's another picture of two different versions. Do you think they're these these people here are? Serious reindeer races, or are they having fun versus these? What's the difference? Who's going faster? Which is more dangerous? So for me, it's like a race, isn't it? That one looks yeah. like a race. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a competition where the different reindeer are participating. It has to be like the winner, it has to be the first one to arrive. Yep, Jorge, go ahead. Me parece que el que va más rápido son los que tienen hasta los implementos. I believe the ones that are going faster are the ones that have all the gear and equipment, like they actually have sort of the headgear and like the helmet. And even their positioning, you can tell that they're like sort of <laughs> in hand over so that they can really go faster. So that was the one that I think is more like a competition. And the other one, I think they're probably like something in the back, like, you know, what they're, what they're using to sit on like the, but yeah, this seems like not much, much of a competition. That's right. You know, again, what I want to reemphasize over and over again is global math stories allow students to take in lots of information and, and make decisions and make comments and then even to debate each other. Because honestly, I could maybe argue that these people are maybe are training to become good at this, or maybe they're making their, their reindeer, they're training their reindeer or making them stronger, or maybe they're going to an event. It definitely looks like it's a, they're a serious event because people literally have special equipment for this racing. So it's something that they clearly valued and they must be at a track here, right? That's been prepared for reindeer racing. Pow, yes. Yeah, by in the chat is saying that uh, it's also about the perspective because the one is has a frontal view and the other one has uh, a lateral view. So it looks like the, the impression is that the mm, lateral is faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. It could be just perspective. And I think that's valuable. There's something to be said about having that debate. And I would say, yes, but look at these people, they're totally not, look at this person's pointing and this person, these people are both holding. So you're right. And it gives, what I love about this is there's enough variation and enough information to gather that we can make decisions about this and have debates. So we actually could do some math, but before we do that, I want you to see some video of reindeer races. There are three different kinds of races here. Tell me what you notice about each one. <laughs> I love the knocking. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right. Is that what you expected? So what did you notice about the tracks about with reindeer racing? These will be something, this noticing, making these notice, notices will help you in the next bit. You, you seem to be able to do it anywhere. It's like, oh, out in the country, through a major city, like all the different places you can do the reindeer racing. And some of the tracks yeah. seem to be longer than the others. Some seem like short sprints and then others appear to be like cross country kind of tracks to me. Yeah, yep, that's good. So there's variety. And it seems like something people train for too. In the last video of the child practicing, that was something. And that's very important. Someone said to me, um, you saw this in Africa earlier today, said, this looks very dangerous. And maybe it is. Yeah. So here's the math problem. I don't want to see that. Hold on. There we go. So there are three reindeer in this race. Where do you think this is? In the city or out in the out somewhere on a round track? What are you thinking? All right, so someone quickly give me an answer so that I can ask the math part. Yes. Hey. Right. Go ahead. In la ciudad. Uh-huh. See, I agree. In the I think city. Uh-huh. I think it's in the city as well uh, because of things we saw before. So probably this is going to be a straight line where they're sprinting, right? Now, this this is, again, what I think is this is what I want to reemphasize over and over again. This is not the math I'm teaching, but that's important stuff to be thinking about because that makes the math make sense. So we have three reindeer that are in a race. We have the one here on the left, the one in the center and one on the right. The one on the left is averaging, is running 21.8 miles meters per second. The one in the middle is running 22 meters per second. And the one on the right is running 22.2 meters perspective. These are legitimate um, speeds, by the way. So the question is, which one wins and why do you think that the one on the left the one in the center or the one on the right any ideas so as someone can come off mute, let me just re up because a lot of you all came in late. Um, I'm fine if you just come off mute and give us an answer for these questions because, um, okay, the, yeah, the person on the right, I see you all answering on in the chat, but it's perfectly fine to also unmute and, and answer as well. Sure, I think so. Yes. So, uh -huh. In the chat, somebody's putting on the right. Uh-huh. And somebody put that it depends on how many meters are missing and, and how many, how much is the acceleration are they going to have time for? Right. So, you know, we can't really say by who wins by how much because there's important missing information. And, and Margarita is asking these great questions, right? Um, how far is this? I can't tell you how, how much they win by because is it, is it a 10, 10 kilometer race or a 100 meter race? That's a big difference. Another thing that Margarita is implying is, can they change speeds? Are they accelerating or decelerating? If, if I'm working with young kids, I might say they're going the same speed because I, I want this to be as easy as possible. But you can complicate the problem based on the age group. But most importantly, the questions you're, you're asking, you're asking about the assumptions you're making. How long is the race? Um, do they change speeds? What do you notice that when you watch a horse race, for instance, what happens during the race? Do they stay the same distance apart? Do they slowly get further apart? Or do things change? They usually change, right? So if I'm teaching middle school students, you know, children who are like grade seven and above, I might ask them to come up with a better problem. 
instead of me giving one for them, they might say, you could say the range of speeds is between 20 meters per second and 22 meters per second. Break it into 100 meter sections. Now who wins? That becomes a really complicated problem that I don't know, as a math person, I'm sort of going, hold on, let me just take a break in this presentation and doing that. Are you thinking that now, pal? I'm just going to do that problem. That would be interesting. Um, I know I am. So it becomes interesting when you change the context in the, in this, in the parameters. And you could do that with global math stories. Most importantly, the teacher needs to be present with the students. You just have to listen to them and do the problem together. So this is my, my point. The problem the reindeer accelerate toward the end of the race. How can we change the problem to include different starting points and changes uh, a speed during this? I want to take a moment here and ask if there are any questions or thoughts. All feel okay? Okay, so what I want to do, and we might move this through this presentation a little bit quicker. Um, so why is this important? To me, teaching this way is important because it, my students have a chance to, to do math in my classroom. So they do math and learn a concept along the way. I've said that a few times now. They also have a chance to listen to other people, to evaluate other people, what other people say, and then provide alternative comments. What I love about Global Math Stories is when you're teaching an objective, it's usually pushing the students to think about something they've not seen before. But when you place it in a context like Global Math Stories, then students have a chance to make connections to stuff they already know they sort of warm up by just saying, here's what I know, here's what I know is right, and they debate each other, so they learn to communicate in that way. To me, those are really good tools. When you're working with teachers in general, if you're doing trainings like some of our staff is, Global Math Stories is a great way to help a teacher stop lecturing because it's hard to lecture about a way of doing math when you're trying to find out which reindeer race, when reindeer wins to race or if they change rates, how does that happen? So those are things that I think are really powerful about Global Math Stories. What are your thoughts about that story, the reindeer racing? Do you think you could use it in your classroom? How might you use it? Any thoughts? Take it in. Oh, sorry. That's fine. Please, no, go ahead. Yeah, I see what you're saying. All right, well, let me tell you all, this is fine, but from here on in the presentation, I'm not talking as much because we have another story. I'm going to tell the story, but you all have to come up with all the math questions. Literally, Anything that you wonder mathematically, you have my permission. You can, if you want to raise your hand, that's fine. If you want to just come off mute and try to talk, we can and see how it goes. But we, you can also write in the comments and maybe Pal can read them. Uh, but I really need you all to, to uh, let us know because I, I, I don't want to tell you the answers. Okay. So, and, and this is a Spanish speaking area. So this might be interesting to you sort of looks a little bit like Ecuador in some ways. So do you know there's a group of islands called the Canary Islands that are just off the coast of Africa and they're Spanish, they're, they, they belong to Spain um, and they're called the Canary Islands. So if I were a teacher, as you are, what kinds of questions might I ask students? What do you notice? What kinds of things do you wonder? And honestly, I love the, what do you notice? What do you wonder? But one important thing is why do you wonder that? I think it's important for your students to start to understand why you think these things are interesting. 
Yes, I saw someone unmute, so please come back. Uh, pienso lo siguiente. Una... Yeah, I think a first exploratory question is why do you think they call this island the Canary Island? Where do you think the name comes from? I would like to hear your ideas. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. That's a good question. I love that it just draws people into the problem, into the into the location. Yeah. And in fact, the islands were named after canaries that live on the islands. What other questions do you have? Yes, Mayra. Podría preguntar cuántas... We could ask how many islands there are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yes, and we'll see that in a second, how many there are. Yeah. Does this look at all like anything you all are familiar with? In Ecuador, I'm surprised no one's saying, wait a second. Yes, Margarita. I'm not, I'm not hearing you, Margarita, I'm not sure. Is anyone else hearing her? Hmm. ¿Quieres pues también dejarlo en el chat, Margarita? Y yo solo leo a, a chat. Mm -hmm. Sí. Yo me put it on the chat and I'll read it. Yeah, that's good. Well, if Margarita is typing, what other kinds of questions might you have like when i look at this there's one thing i fundamentally wonder like which country is closest to canary islands go ahead what's who has who is who's going to say something was that you pal were you talking okay that's fine Yo Yo iba a oh there you go that was that was her question that's good I thank you read you go ahead why does it belong to Spain and not to Morocco? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's right. But then again, you know, why do the Galapagos belong to, yeah, because Galapagos belong to Ecuador and not Mexico. Um, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know why. Let's, we could find out that's what global mass stories do is they prompt it, right? And it's a pretty easy comment to see that these are much closer to Morocco, frankly, closer to Portugal as well. All right, well, let's go on and look at the Canary Islands a little bit. So there are, there are eight islands in this archipelago. You know, and... I see questions here even, you know, how do they compare in size? What questions might you see? I see some numbers here. What do those mean? Imagine what your students would say if you said, even if I said there are eight islands in, in, the, in Canary Islands, I think I made a mistake, didn't I? I see a whole bunch of little islands up here that I didn't count. Maybe those do count. What's the highest elevation, do you think, of the of, of Canary Islands? You could write these in the chat, too. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide. So this is the um, a landscape of the Canary Islands, at least one of them. 
<clears throat> Thanks, Jorge. What might you ask students about? What do you notice? What extra questions do you have? Margarita's got a few. I'm confused by what those little ring semicircles are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you could look at the shape. You could say, they are, are they semicircles? And what's the arc of those? Yeah. There are holes. Why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Why are those holes there? How high is the hill above? There are no trees. Mm -hmm. That's good. I like that. Melba en el chat dice la concavidad es positiva o negativa de los orificios. Oh, I didn't hear that. I understand. No. Melba is asking in the chat about yeah. um, whether the the con concavity is a pos is it negative or positive? Yeah. I don't know. What is it? I, that's a good question. Yeah, to explore it. And, and the debate would be worthwhile, right? Especially if you're teaching that. Yeah. And how big is this? Is this? Are these big rocks? Well, there are. In, so here's an interesting thing. It's, it's a very mountainous area. And you can see some of the ruggedness of it. They were formed by volcanoes. In one way, people communicate. Literally, they can have conversations through whistles. Um, and I just want to show you that. You, you could do a whole lesson about trying to come up with a communication strategy. But here's a video. You can get someone's attention. You could signal something important. Yes, is someone going to say something? OK, and so listen to this conversation. Well, sir. So that was a convert. He literally was saying, hey, there are a bunch of people here and they don't even know what we are, who we are um, through whistles which I think would be fascinating, especially uh, if I were a student. Um, honestly, language and understanding language is, is mathematical in, in nature and to, especially with whistles because there's length, there's tone um, as opposed to words. Oh, I do this again. Goats are pretty quick, quick and agile. You know, honestly, even when you see a picture like this, there's a lot of math questions we can ask. Like, what do you think? What are you looking at? Tell me some things that you're seeing and asking. Guy, I might ask my students, what am I looking at? How many people do you think own this, this group? What do you think? Any questions? Tell me what questions you would ask your students if they saw this slide. You can write them in the chat even if you want. Let's just, how about this? Everyone try to write one question in the chat. Yes, Melva, you can get off. You don't have to type. You can say something. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, there we go. Area, okay. Can you count the goats? I like that, Kim. What other things do you see? Okay, how many is that how many goats are there, right? There are there. Mm-hmm. What else? That next one says how high they are. Oh, how high they are. Got it. Yep. What's the elevation of this location? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. These and these goats are very quick climbers. See, do we have another story about goats that climb trees? Goats are very good climbers. Um, and imagine trying to keep track of these goats on this terrain. We'll look at that more. What else? Otra pregunta podría ser. Another question could be if I close with a fence all the location where the goats are, do you how high would the fence have to be for them not to jump it, or will they be able to jump it mm -hmm. to jump over? That'd be interesting, you know. And and you could even model that with your students and say, let's pretend you're your goats, and then you can um, get a data set of how high kids can jump and then try to gather some things. Jorge, it looks like you're dancing there for a second. That was hilarious. Um, Pal, what were you, you raised your hand. Yes, the color of the animals. I wanted to read the chat. Maritza says how many goats there are. Uh, mm -hmm. Jorge said how high number of animals that are black, number of animals that are white, questions like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a question I have is, is how many herds are there? How many people do you think own those goats? Is that owned by one person or a bunch of people? And why do you think that? What are your thoughts? Any thoughts by, of that, on that? What do you think, Kim? I, I would say one person because I don't see how they're separated. If it was different people, how are they keeping mm -hmm. the herd separated? Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah, I see, I see what you're saying. Huh. Go ahead, but I thought someone else raised their hand. Did I see Maria? Yes, Melba, go ahead. Tell me what you think. Yeah, good afternoon. There seems to be some kind of fence there, if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that they belong to one owner because I only see one division. Mm-hmm. That's what Kim Tall said too. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Did anyone think that they own by they're maybe owned by more than one group of people? Maritza in el chat dice que como el número de cabras es bastante. Maritza says, since the number yeah, of yeah. goats is quite a lot, it could belong to several people. Soraya said, mm -hmm. how many people would work? every day yes. or weekly to take care of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Patricia, Patricia, he's right, speaking English there. Patricia, I see you raised your hand, yes. Yeah. I think maybe they are a group, like a clan of people, right? It could mm -hmm. be a family and all of them work and collaborate uh keeping up with their herd of the goats mm -hmm. because the number is seems quite quite high so i don't know for just one family it would be too complicated and tiresome but mm -hmm. if more families are working in the same activity. I think we could divide the activities, maybe some take morning shifts, maybe others. I I don't know much about goats. Yes. Do they do they milk them? If they milk them, um, they can do maybe there's goat cheese or butter. Uh, mm -hmm. So all kinds of activities. So we could divide the work and teamwork is so much more satisfactory. That's what I wanted to add. Yes, yes. Interesting. 
Kim, what do you think? Do you want to change your mind? Or are you good with still one group? I think it's one person with a big family. There you go. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Um, you know, what I love about this question is I don't know the answer. I don't know. Um, my my thinking is we have to rationalize it. Yes. Does anyone, Pal, you were going to answer ask something. Yes. How were you going to say? Melva in the chat, pregunta también. Melva is asking in the chat, one thing is enough grass with this animal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, they have to be able to wander and you'll see how uh, they keep track of the goats in a second. But that's a really good question. And and honestly, yeah, I don't know the answer to how many people own this either. To me, I would probably guess a lot because um, that's a lot of goats there. And if, if it's only owned by one family, that's going to be a very wealthy family. And that might create a real division. I loved what Patricia said, because as a teacher, wouldn't that be an interesting project is to go, okay, your community owns these goats. Now, how do we divide that equity? How do we divide the value of those goats in the work? And how do we pay you for the work that you're going to do? How do we make that work so it's not fair, so it's fair for everyone? Am I saying that well enough as someone or just, does someone, can someone rephrase it? That'd be a really interesting project. Think about this huge plan you would have to have. If 30 people own that, how would we divide the work? And who would get paid for water? Do they get paid? I don't know. Yes. Se puede, se puede crear un proyecto interdisciplinario. Donde... Basically, it can be like interdisciplinary project in which we, the different areas can intervene. So in math, we can sort of account for everything. So we can think about the feeding of the goats so they can produce better milk. And that way we can also get other products like milk, et cetera, mm -hmm. and do other sort of other products as well that can come out of this animal. And then we can also apply any kind of social areas, meaning things like marketing, publicity, how do we promote these, this place so that also folks can be demotivated for them to really get to know their country better and mm -hmm. and like we you know little by little then people can find out about it and then we end up with a really big business yes that's great i love that this would be a really fun project i almost want to stop and and, and present it to my students and you can and you can, we can continue on with this because the canary islands are a fascinating place for more reasons than and than this but this is this is interesting I mean, these these goats are better climbers than than people that do parkour even. So, and you'll see a, a video of it here in a second. Um, people use these sticks to travel and move from place to place. And so watch this video here. Echaba todos los pequeños saltos que me encontraba en el camino. Mis amigos me decían que, que, que ¿por qué lo hacía? Que, que eso era de viejo, que, de, que no era habitual. Entonces, cuando yo le empecé a enseñar fotos de los lugares donde había podido llegar con esta herramienta, ellos ya les cambió su punto de vista. El salto del pastor es una práctica que, es, eh, por lo que se ha estudiado hasta ahora, parece que es única en el mundo, la, la única zona donde se practica en las Islas Canarias. Vamos, es un legado súper bonito que nos han dejado los antepasados, ¿no? E incluso para recorrer el risco, ¿no? O sea, ustedes antes nos vieron bajando por un... So you have to watch the video to see the rest. That's a long video. But I think it's it's interesting to see how they can do this. So, you know, there's acceleration, deceleration, there's distance, there's time, uh, there are angles in, 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 those, in those questions that you see. Here's another example of someone doing this. Uh, it's called the shepherd's leap. Um, so someone's doing, it looks like they, they're jumping, they land, and the way you hold it, it actually becomes thicker at the bottom so that uh, the diameter of the pole is thicker at the bottom so that that helps slow the individual down. But they still have to have very strong hands. Here's a, here's a couple more pictures of it. 
What kinds of math questions or what kinds of things might you ask about these pictures? Can you all think of anything? Okay, yes. What about the speed, Kim? It makes me wonder how fast you have to be moving for the whole process to work. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like you have to be, you can't, you can't move slow and have and keep the momentum and keep the velocity going. Right. You can't go slow. Metros para coger la impulsación? And how many meters you need to be able to sort of gain enough impulse? Because you have to like, it's like mm -hmm. run a little bit and then jump. Like you have to put the stick down and then you have to sort of, I guess, push yourself up. But it has to be like with enough speed. Yes, you have to be enough. You have to be big enough. And so even, yeah, like one thing is, what's the maximum height a person can jump up? Because... There's only the height of the stick plus the height of them. Can they go all the way to the top like the person running, climbing up on the wall? Uh, the speed is is really interesting too. What's the, what's the speed that is is hurtful that hurts people? Um, and so how how fast do they have to slow? So now we're getting it back into deceleration acceleration. Uh, what was yep? There's the angles of course. Uh, quadratic equation. Well done, pal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's good. I, I would be interested even to like, you could do some modeling here too, even like say, let's let's make some sticks that are thicker at the bottom and thin at the top and the other way around and see which ones are more effective at slowing something down. Uh, we we have, a, I have an idea, obviously what would be more effective. Yeah. Uh, and this is an important part of the tradition in, in the Canary Islands. Um, the shepherds, it's called the shepherd's leap. And um, it's a tra tradition that's been passed down. They're losing the tradition because fewer and fewer people are, are raising goats. They're, you know, becoming more industrial. Uh, but this is a tradition that is, has, has been passed down from generation to generation. The goats travel uh, pretty long distances to eat the food and, and, and find, find enough grass to survive because it's a pretty pretty arid environment it seems like to me yeah so this is pretty much the end of my presentation so what i want to do is ask questions that you have i know i'm done a little early um i would love to have you all fill five or ten minutes with questions wanted to leave that questions or thoughts or ways Love to hear ways that you might use this in your classroom. What are your thoughts? Okay, well. That's a, yes, Pal raised your hand. Thank you, Pal. What's your what's your question or thought? Me gustaría si podíamos aprovechar simplemente el espacio para. Could we take advantage of this space uh, to explore where these stories are located? Because we have not been able to do this in other sessions. Mm -hmm. So if you could help us and share with us how to access these stories, like the two that you just showed us. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great, Pal. Thanks for suggesting that. So, I guess yeah, it's good. También um, hay una pregunta de Margarita aquí que dice, ¿cómo se relaciona? Margarita has a question also. How is this connected to that Olympic competition that they have with like the long jump or I'm not sure what they call it, but in the Olympics it was the pole vault. jump like this. The pole vault, yes. You know, it's, I think it'd be similar. Yeah, it'd be certainly interesting to compare the two. Um, I don't know. I know the pole ball is very different, right? That pole bends and it springs people up. But then this, you're starting at a higher 
level. That'd be very interesting to see. Yeah. We know, I know that my wife and I wrote this uh, story for a person that worked for MathKind, and they do this also in New Zealand, uh, this kind of thing. And um, they're trying to sort of start, you can now go to a club for a weekend and learn how to do the Shepherd's Lee if you went to New Zealand. I, I, I couldn't because I'm a little old, I think. So anyway, if you... Um, you can just go to the MathKind website or you can Google one of the words. Now, the resources is Mete Mundayo. Is that how you pronounce it, Mundayo? Um, you probably could Google that. I know if you just literally Google we are one of the first hits. So it comes back up as the global math stories. Um, now, the stories, this is the English version but we have them all written in Spanish. Well, not all of them, many of them are written in Spanish and we will have more coming soon. So let's see, where's the, let's see the, we can do the Canary Islands. Here we go. I don't know if we have that one actually, but we do have reindeer races, here we go. So here's the story about reindeer races that I, and I just translated, I apologize. Uh, let me go back to Spanish. There we go. So uh, this one was written by my wife. I think she wrote this for me for Christmas one time. Um, but here's the story. It's literally meant to be a one paragraph, one page story that you all can read. This is translated by Hans. And then there's some, some questions that you might ask students that we have on this site. Some of these have PowerPoint presentations. I think the one that you saw today we'll try to put onto the website. What I like are these sort of exploration for the further social justice questions, because it gives you, the teacher, a chance to show, um, to ask more challenging questions. And then um, here's some more explorations. These are some of the, websites that we've used to get this gather this information and then finally here's an opportunity for you to submit a story of your own excuse me um what what i find is i'm always fascinated by things that happen in other people's homes or where that happens in their local communities so things that you think are just typical are, are really interesting the people that live in finland go well of course everyone should do reindeer racing how could you not know about it it's like me in the United States expecting you all to know about U.S. football, which you may know more about nowadays, but you certainly wouldn't before. Um, and so those are interesting stories, and we, we love for people to submit them. What will be coming, I believe, in the next three to five months are lessons that you can actually download about these stories so you can use them into your classroom. That's our goal. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's one of those stories. Um, and the the um, Canary Island story is not available there, but we have it on, it's in English. And I know that you all sometimes can have translations here. Some of these stories have slideshows attached to them, like this one. And this is where I pulled the slideshow that you guys mostly saw just now. A little bit of a history. The idea is for you, the teacher, to pull out what you want to use in your classroom, but not have to go through the whole slideshow. So it should be interesting things for you, but not something you should do the entirely for yourself. Any questions on the Global Math Stories website, or do you all feel like you know how to use it or get to it? I wonder what happens if I Google that. I spell this right? No, I misspelled it, didn't I? No, that's right. So it didn't come out yet. We have to have more. People need to visit it before it comes out as 
global global mass stories. Yeah. So you have to Google global mass stories for it to be a pop top hit. Any other co comments or thoughts or questions? Requests? Any any because I'm happy to talk about this or ask answer questions. Great. Well, thank you all for attending. And you have a little bit of time before the next presentation to, to get some tea or coffee or enjoy something or take a look at one of these stories. Thank you all very much. <laughs>